Good morning. And happy Mother's Day. It's lovely to see some extra mums here that you've brought. It's lovely. Um, I'm Marita Rigg. And as he said, we have three beautiful children. Um, would you open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1? And that's on page 1130 of the Bibles in the church. That's 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we're just going to look at one verse. So this is the introduction. Verse 5, Paul says to Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. So as we start, shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for this special day to celebrate mothers. Would you open our eyes, Lord, to everything that you intended for motherhood? And would you speak into our hearts today? Amen. American actor and comedian Milton Berle said, If evolution worked, how come mothers only have two hands? Well, I, I'm not going anywhere near evolution today, but I am going to talk about the amazing job that mothers can do with the two hands that God has given them. I'm not going to talk so much about the nitty-gritty of parenting. We've got an amazing parenting course, which we're running again in the autumn, and I would encourage you to sign up for that. But we are going to think more about a vision for motherhood. And that is a vision that we can all get behind and own. Whether you are married, whether you're single, whether you're a man or whether you're a woman. And I do pray today that God will speak very personally to you, whatever your situation is. Being a mum isn't easy. But it is a job that has eternal influence. 17th century poet George Herbert said, One good mother is worth a hundred schoolmasters. So what is our vision for motherhood? This verse in 2 Timothy gives us a wonderful vision for motherhood today. Paul here gives us a little window into what had made Timothy the man he'd become. He'd had a godly home, and he'd been well instructed in the Old Testament. We see in chapter 3, verse 15, it says, From infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. Calvin delightfully said of Timothy, He was reared in his infancy in such a way that he could suck in godliness along with his mother's milk. So like Lois and Eunice, we want to raise godly children and we want to leave a legacy that lasts. There's a card out this year that says, mums are like buttons, they hold it all together. And this is very true of my amazing mother. At 84, she still um, takes a very active part in her church, and she still holds us all together as a family. She's been a vital part of my Christian journey, from helping me to read the Bible as a child, through to praying for me right through to today and probably now. I value her prayers for me so deeply. I don't yet know everything they've accomplished, but I do see a family who is serving God, giving birth to new families who are also serving God. My story is one of great privilege, and I'm very, very grateful for that. I'm the youngest of four daughters and one son, hence my mum being um, so old. It's not because I'm old. Just so you know that. Um, And I've been able to watch my sisters go through the mothering stakes before me and learn from them as well. One of my nieces got married two years ago, very young, but very strong, and another one's getting married this summer. And um, they are just incredibly godly girls marrying young, strong Christian men. I see the fruit of godly mothering and grandmothering on both sides, actually. I'm sure not without its ups and downs, but amazing godly girls coming out the other end who I know will take their place as, as mothers too. That's the legacy we want to leave. But are we trapped or free as mothers? There's a well-known and much-loved film, which you've probably seen, um, much-loved in our family, I don't know whether you like it, but called The Parent Trap. 
Many people feel that this describes motherhood. But being a mother doesn't have to be about being trapped. It can actually be about being incredibly fulfilled and free. I don't always feel like that, and some of you will have seen me at times when I'm clearly not. I'm a very slow learner. There's plenty of exhaustion along the way, and major struggles too. But these are all part of a great journey, which, as we've seen from the scripture, can leave an amazing legacy. However, sometimes we do feel trapped, and we're going to have a look at some of these traps. Firstly, the devaluing of motherhood in in our society. As mothers, do you dread, actually anybody, do you dread that question, what do you do? It's so easy to fall into that trap of, I am what I do. There's a book out called What Mothers Do When It Looks Like Nothing. And uh, some of you will relate to the blurb, which says, Have you ever spent all day looking after your baby or young child and ended up feeling that you've done nothing all day? Do you sometimes find it hard to feel pleased with what you're doing and tell yourself you should achieve more with your time? Maybe it's because you can't see how much you are doing already. God values mothers. Mothering is part of his nature. In Luke 13, verse 34, Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And one of the Ten Commandments, honour your father and your mother. We can be completely fulfilled in this role. John 10.10 says, Jesus came to bring life in all its fullness, and it doesn't say except motherhood. Rose Kennedy, mother of nine, including John F. Kennedy, said this. I looked on child rearing not only as a work of love and duty, but as a profession that was fully as interesting and challenging as any honourable profession in the world, and one that demanded the best that I could bring to it. Another trap we can fall into is putting our children before God. And this can creep in without us realising One mum recently said to me, after my first love in marriage, which I thought was the ultimate feeling of human love, the love I felt when I had children was overpowering. So strong is that love that I had made my children my God, basing my measure of success by their happiness and love. In my endeavour to be supermum, I had lost my focus on God as the centre of my life. Ed said two weeks ago that we need to be grounded in God, that we are first and foremost a child of God. That means that our children are also first and foremost children of God, and that's a wonderful freedom. One journalist said, there are two things we need to give our children. One is roots, and the other is wings. And as they get older, this becomes more and more important. Rob Parsons, MBE now, who heads up Care for the Family, said this. Some of us as parents have a characteristic that is almost certain to make the process of letting go agony for us and almost unbearable to our teenagers. It is the need to control. I learnt that I couldn't control children before they were even born. It took us a while before we had our first child, and in that waiting time I had several miscarriages. I learnt very painfully that we are totally not in control. But when we put God first, we can relinquish control and set our children free to be who God wants them to be. Thirdly, and this is a big one, the trap of comparisons. We compare ourselves to each other and we also compare ourselves to that model perfect mother who seems to be able to do everything. And that puts very unreal expectations on us. Are we yummy mummies or are we slummy mummies? I love that picture. That's me. Actress Michelle Pfeiffer said, Like all parents, my husband and I do the best we can, hold our breath and hope we've set aside enough money for our kids' therapy. We all will make mistakes, but that's okay, because our God is a great big God. Psalm 139 should be daily food for us. Verse 13, 
You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Verse 16, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. We are unique and we were all mother in our own unique way. Fourthly, is the, the trap of fear. As mothers, particularly, we can be overprotective of our children out of fear. One mother at school told me the hardest thing for her about being a mother is having to watch her children going through painful things. Our tendency is to want to protect them from everything, and we can be eaten up by that fear. But 1 John 4 tells us God's perfect love drives out all fear. We need to commit our children into God's hands. He loves them so much more than we do. So God wants us to be free from all the traps around us. Paul writes, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So are we surviving or thriving as mothers? We thrive firstly and most importantly by staying close to Jesus. And this is the best thing we can possibly do for our children. When we first become mothers, our normal prayer and Bible reading patterns probably go out of the window. But we can ask the Holy Spirit to help us to be creative with the time that we do have in this season to draw near to God. He understands the challenges. Isaiah 40 verse 11 says, He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. I love the Psalms and the images of God as my strong tower and my hiding place. John Wesley preached his last sermon in this church and he preached to thousands of others all over the country. Charles, his brother, wrote hundreds of hymns that are still used today. Their mother, Susanna Wesley, who had 17 other children. Um, <laughs> although she never preached a sermon or published a book or founded a church, she is known as the mother of Methodism. Her sons simply applied the example and teachings and circumstances of their home life. Susanna prayed for two hours a day. And if she couldn't find a room to retreat to, she would simply flip her apron up over her head and get on with it. Cultivating an atmosphere of thanksgiving in our homes is important for thriving. Firstly, for our amazing saviour, Jesus. And as we look forward to Easter, just remembering his perfect self-sacrifice, um, going through his death on the cross out of love for you and me. And especially today, as we've said already, for our own mothers, just taking time to appreciate their input and the sacrifice they made for us too. Just be thankful for our children, if we have them, and the privilege of motherhood, and so much more. Make your homes a place of worship and praise. Listen to worship music. Listen to inspiring talks while you're doing jobs. Whatever it takes for you, stay close to Jesus. Secondly, we need to make the most of this season. Writer and speaker Christine Kane, who we've already seen this morning, and uh, we met at Focus last year, has written a book called, Can I Have and Do It All, Please? Now, this isn't a question I've personally ever asked, but <laughs> for those of you who have, we need to not misunderstand the all in that question. That all is God's all for you, and it's his personal um, journey and things that he's planned for you. Now, I'm not sure if Helen's here. Yeah, she is. I've asked Helen to come up. Uh, very kindly, she's come out of Wobblers. And just to tell us about um, some of the things that she feels are her all from God for this season in her life. Thank you, Helen. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm Helen. I'm married to Jonathan. I've been married for about 11 years, and we have three young boys who are six, four, and three. Um, I am a working mother, and actually returned to work when Barnaby was five months old, and I've combined work and motherhood ever since. Um, I wouldn't describe myself as a career as career-driven or professionally ambitious, um, so it's not necessarily about achieving success in the workplace, 
but um, our desire, or my decision to combine work is more around a desire to live and raise our family in the city, and with that comes a financial cost. Um, and so it's for that reason we decided I would continue to work in order that we didn't find ourselves facing the dilemma of having to move out to the suburbs because we really feel our calling is to the city. So it was really a practical reaction to, uh, to moving, to going back to work was, was due to that um, desire to be here and, and living out in the city with our children. Um, it is easy to be overwhelmed by the responsibility of being a mother um, and there are lots of other important roles in our lives that as friends, as wives, as uh, daughters, as neighbours, as colleagues, as school governors. So it's motherhood in the context of all the other roles that we, um, we're responsible for in our lives. Um, Louis just asked me to talk really briefly about how I try and make it work in our family. So I'm fortunate enough to work flexible hours. I do 25 hours a week and I'm able to fit those around the school day. So I work nine till two. And within that, there are benefits like my husband being able to drop the boys at school and I can collect them. So it's this sense of we're able to be there at the school gate and that's something that's always going to be important to us as they go through school. Um, grandparents are a lifeline for us. Um, we have one set 30 minutes away and another set um, three hours away, but they're both incredibly generous with their time and they give us a lot of emotional and practical support. Um, our children meet the rewards of that through deep and trusting relationships with the grandparents and um, uh, and uh, the parents, grandparents get a lot out of it as well. So we don't take them for granted, we, but we do really, really value their help and we're very fortunate that they're geographically not too far away. Um, building networks with other families around us for mutual support. Um, trusted friends that can pick up your children in an emergency or form part of a neighbourhood babysitting network, which is something we've set up on our local streets. Um, and there's other friends and neighbours that don't have children, but they're equally important and bring another dimension to your own family's life. Um, time with God can easily go out the window when you have children. Um, and I'm superbly undisciplined in this area, but um, we host a connect group, so we've got no excuse for not turning up to connect group. Mm -hmm. And um, also, Louis has given us a lot of encouragement through um, being a mother in this church for six and a half years. Um, and Louis has been really encouraging about getting mothers into prayer groups, um, which I've been a part of now for about two years. And part of my flexible working actually built into that my ability to go to a, a daytime prayer group, so I'm very lucky. Um, lessons learned. I think the biggest lesson learned really is um, if I had my time over again, I wouldn't have gone back to work so soon. Um, there's definitely a time and a place to work, but I think having had three children, I now reflect on that and say, yeah, I, um, you know, with the other two, I was able to stay off longer. Um, and I, that was based on, I think, we, we probably feared for our finance, financial security more six years ago than we do now. Um, and I think we're a lot better at trusting God's provision for us. We've seen him bless us a lot during that time and we've adjusted our perspective greatly so that when I was made redundant in 2009, while I was on maternity leave with my third child, um, it no longer became a worry. We had a lot more peace about our situation and the outcome of that was being off work for 18 months, um, so a much nicer period of time and, and then um, God answered prayers in the job I have now um, is a real answer to prayer, which combines all the best elements of being able to try and combine work and motherhood. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thirdly, we can thrive by spending great quality time with our children, taking the opportunities to teach them and have fun with them. I saw this story on Facebook. I hope it wasn't any of you. <laughs> Um, on Pancake Day, two brothers, a five-year-old and a three-year-old, were arguing at the dinner table as to who should have the first pancake. Their mother thought it was a great opportunity to teach the boys about Jesus. She turned to them and said, Boys, if Jesus were here, he would let his brother have the first pancake. The boys thought about this for a moment, and then the older one turned to his brother and said, OK, you be Jesus. LAUGHTER um, Fuzz is now, I hope, here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And Fuzz is going to come up. I know she's amazing at this. She's going to come and tell us about the ways that she has great time with her boys. 
Well, so I don't know if I'm always amazing at it. One thing I realised was that if I'm trying to do something at the same time as look after my children, then I don't have an amazing time with them because they've always got questions and um, demands in the nicest possible way. And if I'm trying to cook tea or get jobs done while I'm also looking after all three of them, that can be really frustrating. So what I've actually been doing for the last year or so probably is for the hour when I pick the boys up from school, our two oldest are at school, so I pick them up at 330 amazingly live two minutes away so we're home by 3.32 or 3.35 and then I know in my head that I don't need to do anything until at least half past four which means I do need to cook tea before I get them or put something in the oven or the slow cooker but then they know that they've got my undivided attention for that whole hour and there's still wrangles and wrestles as the three of them sort of try and get my attention but it means that I know I'm not trying to palm them off and say oh just just do this for a minute or just can Barney sort out the younger two but I can really try and invest that time in doing some craft or being outside in the garden and playing with them so that's been one of my ways of sort of adjusting to just realizing how I can have fun with them instead of trying to do too much and then just getting a bit stressed by it um, another thing we've been doing is our three boys as you've probably seen are quite well they're very boyish and energetic and so of course they're real daddy's boys and they love to wrestle and climb all over Ed and particularly at the moment I'm no good for any of that so <laughs> I've been sort of developing my own niche with our children um, and working out what are the things that I can do as a mum that is unique that um, that they feel that's something they can look forward to doing with me. So Toby, for example, our middle one, he's five, loves baking. So quite often on a Saturday, we'll have a baking hour while Ed is doing a Lego hour with Barney. And Zach, who's the youngest, who's three, kind of flits between the two, being semi-destructive <laughs> in both directions. But at least Toby knows that's something that we can do and will be really, he'll enjoy it. I love baking as well. Makes a huge mess in the kitchen, but then we have something tasty at the end of it. Um, and also I've been doing, since we did the parenting course in the autumn term, I've been doing what the boys call special mummy time. So every few weeks, just before half term, I'll take them individually to Gastronomica, our great little coffee shop, and just me and one of them, and we'll sit down and take something that they love to do. So Barney and I will play chess or connect four or something, and Toby will bring some little craft that he wants to make and cut out, and we'll just set up camp in Gastronomica for an hour, and just have, they, we can just have little chats, but it's not too pressured, because they won't sit and chat to me just for an hour, but if we're doing something together, um, and also amazingly, last time we went, both times I went two consecutive days in a row, and the man from Gastronomica gave them both a freebie. It was great. Yay. So they were like special mummy times, amazing. We get lemonade and free cakes. So yeah, it's just been just, and I think it changes all the time as they as they change with the ages and number of children that we have changes. But I think being ready to sort of be adaptable and think, I know they're so fun, and I don't want to sort of rush over that and flit over it by the busyness. So carving out it means being really intentional, but it's definitely worth it. Brilliant, thank you very much, guys. You guys can go and enjoy your Mother's Day properly now. Um, fourthly, we can thrive by recognising that while motherhood is a demanding, lifelong role, it has massive benefits. The overwhelming love, the pleasure of nurturing children and watching them grow, and being a mother continually changes us and sends us to our knees. We learn to persevere. Abraham Lincoln said, I remember my mother's prayers and they have always followed me. They have clung to me all my life. Praying like that changes us as well as our children. And God is so gracious. He provides for all our mothering needs. In Isaiah 40, it says, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. Fifthly, we can thrive by looking out and grasping the vision to influence our world through our godly mothering. Pope John Paul II said, As the family goes, so goes the nation, and so goes the whole world in which we live. So let's be a part of making our nation go better. Let's speak into our society by our commitment and our confidence to our role as mothers. One author said, we're ordinary people, but we're made extraordinary by our closeness to Jesus, by our choices 
and our willingness to be used and become part of God's purposes. This season gives us unique opportunities to reach out to other mothers and those around us in our community, as Helen was talking about earlier. So let's be the solid foundation that I believe we were designed to be. And let's help each other to do it joyfully. Which leads me to my final point. Again, as Helen said, we can thrive by being in community and asking for help. This is where we can all get involved. Mums need everyone to affirm them and love them and pray for them. And as a church, we provide mum, uh, mums, new mums and dads meals. And we've got two new babies at the minute. And we'd love you to be part of the cooking team. We also have a growing mums and tums group on a Wednesday morning where mums in our community can come and connect together. They do pray for us or visit us. Pray that the connections go really deep there. We also have small groups for mums where they can be open and accountable to each other to pray for each other, to share the good and the not so good. So do talk to me if you'd like to be part of something like that. And sometimes we have grandmothers who come and be with our new mums. And in closing, I've asked if Mel and her mum Jane would come up. I've spoiled some more Mother's Days. <laughs> and just um, to tell us about the wonderful thing it is to be three generations of godly girls. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> so, firstly, thank you. <laughs> so this is so this is Abigail. Oh, thank you. So, firstly, Jane, um, how have you prayed for Mel over the years? I think we'd be here all week. <laughs> if I told you all the pre's, but the, the way to sum it up is if you can think of a newborn with a blanket, a blanket that is woven, bright and colourful, some threads are very thin and some are very thick, and as a baby I would wrap her, and as you say, there's not much time to pray when you're a mother and, and you've got a tiny tot, but I would through that blanket being around her, love her and pray for her in simple prayers, just plain motherly prayers. Then as she grew up and went to school, that, that blanket would become more colourful and you do pray for protection and you want to just cuddle them, but your prayers become a little bit more stronger in Christ. Um, the main thread that went through the blanket throughout her, her life and still is that obviously um, I would have loved her to given her life as a young child which she did and then obviously I prayed for a Christian husband who was active in the church um, and there were many other prayers that I would pray and you know those little threads that had big knots in you will get there <laughs> and you will get through them but um, my prayer for Melanie was always that she would be a happy, fun-loving child, that she would accept Christ, that she would live a Christ-like life, and that when it did come to this, the, the time where you have to let go of those wings, um, I would let that blanket fall, Melanie would be in the centre of that blanket, and now when I leave to go back home, miles and miles away, that God would use that blanket to love her, protect her, guide her. And I just pray that she will continue to be a Christian woman and thrive on Proverbs 31. And if you young mothers don't know what Proverbs 31 is, please go home and read it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Mel, um, what's it been like having your mum here at this amazing moment in your life? I've had to write some notes because, <laughs> um, well, yeah, it's been an absolute privilege having my mum here. Um, she's just, she's given up so much of her time, two and a half months of her life, and leaving my dad <laughs> to come over um, and just to share her wisdom and knowledge of motherhood with me. Um, she's also, she's been an incredible amount of support and guidance for me, um, which has given me peace in knowing that I can be a good mother. Mm -hmm. 
And I know it's very early, but yes. what are some of the things that you're already feeling and longing and praying for for Abigail? Um, I think the things I'm longing for is to grow closer and closer to Abigail um, so that as she grows into a healthy, fun-loving, spirit-filled child, um, mm. that's what I long for. And then my prayers for her are yeah, that she'll walk close to the Lord and that she'll desire to give her heart and give her life to the Lord. So, yeah. Thank yeah. you all three of you very much. So let's give ourselves, all of us, to the wonderful task of raising godly children and leaving an amazing legacy for our children, for our children's children, that can change the world. Shall we pray?